I would like to tell you um, and describe three revolutions from science and technology and then show you if there is an integration of these three um, 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 new revolutions in science and technology that we can fundamentally improve how we understand the brain and that we can also develop fundamentally new solutions to treat brain um, diseases. These three revolutions, I'm going to start with robotics, and in particular, industrial robotics. They have an amazing efficiency, accuracy, and speed in order to do many tasks we do not want to do. And in this commercial that you see here, this may be a little bit exaggerated. Nevertheless, it shows the fascination we have with those industrial robots, carrying out human functions in a beautiful way. But those are not the robots that I would like to talk about the robots that I will talk about, they have left the factory. They're now close to our body. They are replacing body parts if we have lost them, if we cannot move anymore, and they can support our action. They are wearable robots, so they will be our companions. The first revolution. The second revolution is computer science. Imagine these TV 20 inch, black and white, low resolution kind of TV screens that have moved forward to projecting a three-dimensional colorful world to all walls of this auditorium, to the floor, and creating immersive virtual experiences. Again, the issue of wearable is very important. From the screen towards and approaching the eye and the ears towards wearable devices, $2 billion just paid for the system that you see here in order to link this with wearable um, technology and social media. The third revolution, that's my own field of research, neuroscience and neurology, that you can see here, millisecond and, and microscale resolution in time and space that we now have to non-invasively map stru structure and function of the brain. Structure of the brain here, function of the brain that you see here, and also brain stimulation. So these three revolutions have changed science, and this is the past 10 to 20 years where this has happened, but what is fundamentally missing is that these fields start talking to each other. And what I argue is that for understanding brain and mind, these three fields need to be integrated, creating literally a new field, and focusing on cognetics, we move from robotics towards these cognetics, from these scenarios, moving more and more to wearable and omnipresent systems, from computer science, the same for robotics, where wearable robotics will eventually turn into smart textiles. These clothings are too old-fashioned. The future, I think 10, 20 years, will show that we will wear equipment, if we want to, that monitor and can also control certain of our actions and support us should we not be able to walk anymore. And then these neurotechnologies, again, need to be integrated. This is the field and the first conclusion, really, cognetics is important to be introduced. So how can you bring cognetics and what's the, the work that has been done uh, in cognetics? Apart from my own research, over the last 10 years, we have looked how we can use these cognetics techniques, virtual reality in particular on this slide, in order to understand better what calculates the self in my brain. What role plays the body and how this body is represented in the brain for generating a self-conscious experience. We've used head-mounted display, different kind of stimulations of applying tactile cues to the skin, to the hand, to the leg, to the back of our subjects, and then presenting them in very many avatar scenarios over the head-mounted display to the subject. One line of work where we used a very particular body D signal that I would like to use and, and, and present during uh, this presentation has been the heartbeat signal. Very difficult to detect um, if asked subjectively to, to say what your heartbeat is, but what we have used in these scenarios is to detect the heartbeat and measure it and online use this information to change the appearance of our avatar that this subject that you see here in one of our experiences is, is, is carrying out. So the subject wears a head-mounted display and is seeing in real time those animations. This can be heartbeats, it could be any kind of other signals. And when we use and animate this avatar in this way, what happens is there is a shift of where subjects localize the self to be. 
I would localize myself a few meters in front if I were exposed to these scenarios for about two to three minutes. And what we were able to show in much research is that we can induce out-of-body experience not in a parapsychological, paranormal way, but we can do this under controlled experimental laboratory conditions. This to show you again that these scenarios, again using head-mounted displays, using now robotic stimulation tools, which also allows us to measure or to stimulate the body in association with scanners, with the main brain imaging tools, allowing you to map the structure and the function. So what these data show is that if you are exposed on the particular um, 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 case, the subject is standing here and you're seeing different sorts of avatars that are associated with your body. It's a simulation of an, an exoskeleton that you would wear around your body here presented over a virtual reality screen then the avatar feels like your body. You feel touch, not at the physical body here but at the avatar's position and you can induce this out-of-body experience that I've talked about that normally happens only under strange and abnormal conditions but can here be induced in a controlled way. However, these changes, they come with consequences. If after this illusion we apply a touch cue to the subject, they perceive them less well. The body of our subject starts to cool down if you would have these avatar illusions. Moreover, you support more pain should we test this during the illusion. So there seems to be a subtle balance between how much my self is localized at the avatar and how much at my real body that we can um, understand and induce using these cognetics approaches. I want to switch now to the second part of my talk. How can we apply this knowledge, these cognetics tools, not just for the self, but also for disorders of emotions, anxiety, and schizophrenia, to give some examples. We have to act very quickly because the numbers or the three facts that I show you here on the screen are massive and are very disconcerting. Half a billion of people on this planet suffer from a neurological or psychiatric disease. Half a billion. And for many of these diseases, I just list here Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, we don't have efficient therapies and cures. In the case of schizophrenia, which is 1% of the population, this means lifelong treatments by drugs that do not treat efficiently the disease. The most scary and most recent news is that pharmaceutical companies are leaving the development, the research and development for new drugs for brain and mental diseases. So our medical cabinet, it should be packed. Frankly, we have such good understanding of medicine and biology. Why is our medical cabinet empty for these diseases? And the pharma industry says, if you just look at this slide, the new drug approvals shown here in red is more or less the same. In that same period from 1960 to, to, uh, to, to today, the expenditure, the costs for developing one new drug has increased in this way. So the pharma industry, it's not a good market to be in. Too expensive and not enough feedback. So we have to come up with um, new approaches and one approach that I would like to, to, to say is to use the cognetics approach which is entirely non-invasive for the development of novel treatments for mental and brain diseases like a drug is dedicated, a molecule is dedicated and targets a certain receptor in the brain or outside the brain our cognisuticals, cognitive uh, therapies of the type that are presented to you will have to be matched and engineered to, to fit to the disease and to the patient. Just again, three examples how we have started to do this in the laboratory. I start with pain conditions. So there is, in the case of stroke or amputation, like I show you, show you on, on, on this subject, you see that the, this part is the painful body part. There is a, an increased redness. There is a deformation of the foot. There can also be a swelling of the hand here in the case of complex regional pain syndrome. So what we have started to use is develop smart textiles but also virtual reality scenarios again to be able to virtually touch or to touch avatar-like hands in order to simulate touch and therapy for these patients because if in these instances you touch the hand the patient will refuse, and refuse to continue because the pain that is induced is so strong. 
other scenarios in this patient's uh, su uh, subject suffering from uh, limb amputation, how do you treat pain in a limb that doesn't exist anymore, phantom limb pain? Again, our treatments will be a very powerful solution and we, we have shown this in, in several studies. Paraplegia, people sitting in a wheelchair because there is an impossibility due to spinal cord injury to move or feel stimuli from the leg. The only thing many of these patients feel is pain. Imagine to feel pain in a body part that you can neither move nor feel anything else about than pain. Again, our stimulations using some automatized stimulation setups that the patient could use in a daily fashion at home is a way that we're going currently in my research laboratory. A totally different disorder, which has also been linked to self uh, disturbances, is schizophrenia. I mentioned it, 1% of the population, lifelong treatment. You just imagine again, the best treatments we have today are developed or were developed in the 50s and 60s. Since then, no fundamentally new treatment principle. So what we argue, again, bringing robotics, uh, head-mounted displays and virtual reality is to treat some of these hallucinations that these patients experience, alien voices, delusions of persecution, and trying to erase or at least um, decrease the presence of these illusions. Again, entirely non-invasively and possibly um, in um, persisting treatments over several years. I had in the title the, um, the name Pacemakers of the Mind, there is a third revolution to cognetics and cognoceuticals that needs to be at some point integrated. You see the tremendous changes that from the first pacemaker in the 50s, where the patient here was accompanied, had a device, a large device, the defibrillator with him, and could only walk so far as the cable would, would allow. Today you've seen the revolution with a system today only wearing a few grams, which is totally implanted. This revolution has, over the last 20 years, also reached brain diseases, and not only Parkinson's disease, but also depression and Alzheimer's disease are being explored to enhance not only movement, but also memory and, and affective states. What, what I would like to sum up really is that pharmaceutical treatments will certainly continue to have a major effect. There's very many established cognitive behavioral treatments for many disorders. However, we're missing a chance if we wouldn't exploit and further develop those through different three different techniques, revolutions really that I've mentioned, wearable robotics and bringing it all the way to long-term wearable medical devices if you want. The second point is computer graphics to not only control bodily stimulation but also what we present to the visual system and to the hearing system and then last not least exploit insights into ba from basic neuroscience and translate them into the clinic. Thank you.